I mean, you get one sin out of your life, right? Maybe you have a little success. You pray, oh, Lord, and you you work on it, and you get some bad habit out of your life. And, but... <laughs> Do you? <laughs> if you do. No, I know. If you do. Lord, yeah. help us if we do. Lord, help me. Well, welcome back to Deep in Christ. Welcome, Brother Father Peter. Thank you. Yeah. No. Nice table. <laughs> yeah. Welcome. We have a kind of new a new set. set. How about this? How about this? It's We're cool. starting sort of like a new season, if you will, hmm. of this show. I started the show last summer during the pandemic. Mm-hmm. Um, and I didn't 100%, 100% know where we'd be going exactly with it. I mean, we knew that in the, in the panoply, in the lineup of Coming Home Network content, there was a space for a show that wasn't apologetics. Mm-hmm. That was just talking more about, hey, wherever you are in your journey, you know, whether you're a lifelong Catholic, like our, many of our supporters, or whether you're one of our primary audience, which mm-hmm. are uh, people who are thinking about becoming Catholic or people who have become Catholic and they're still sort of figuring out their their spot, you know, figuring out being Catholic. Talk about what we all have in common. The mm-hmm. whole reason we're doing all of this is which is that, hey, no matter what stage of the journey you're in, um, we're to be going deeper in Christ. Mm-hmm. We're to be following him, surrendering him, listening to him. I didn't realize you just started this only last year. For yeah. some reason, I thought you'd been doing this for like a couple Well, <laughs> funny story about that. <laughs> yeah, right. It's like... there's, been, there's been different iterations. There was ah, about 10 nice. years ago, I did a couple interviews. Maybe those can be bonus content in the community I'll put well, up there. There you go. With Brother Rex and Kevin Lowry and, oh, with Joseph Pierce. The yeah. never before released footage of Joseph Pierce, who... Doing stuff? <laughs> what? <laughs> what? I guess okay. that's not as impressive. I don't know. He he's I a mean, cool guy. I know Joseph Pierce is. But yeah, yeah. Literary converts and all that. Yeah, he's a I neat just guy. Didn't, didn't realize I'll that. Pull that yeah. out. I didn't didn't realize that. Uh, you know, <laughs> video time with him was that scarce. But at that time, at that time, it was, was quite. I was. Oh, okay. I was rather taken. He was oh, a pretty cool gotcha. guy. Okay. Anyway. you know, it's funny because yes. this sort of kind of goes to what we're, <laughs> a little bit what we'll talk about today, but yeah. just because of because of our childhood like prominent Catholic figures. I forget which ones that I should be like impressed by. <laughs> that sounds me. really weird. But but well it's because like we you know we grew up the, down like the street from Scott Hahn and so it's like yeah Scott right, Hahn right, right, you know right. and it's like and I forget which ones we don't know. <laughs> you know? It, it's like because I'm like I'm pretty sure dad knew that guy when we were growing up or like I <laughs> he think was we next knew door him. neighbor. Did he right? babysit us yeah, he, time? His, his kids babysit yeah, us. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. That's right. really funny. <laughs> so so when you said that I was like, I thought we knew him already. I was like, Oh yeah. I don't know. But yeah. Well forget, no, that is forget. that is really interesting. It is this is a weird to yeah, today weird because thing. we 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 thought we would you know so one thing that's happened over this past year is that we got recording together. We were working on the virtues stuff and we discovered we enjoy this sort of format, this discussion format, talking about our faith, talking about our faith as brothers, talking about our faith as guys in two very different vocations in life, mm-hmm. but also two, two guys who, again, here in the context of the Coming Home Network, um, we are the fruit of of elders in the faith, elder, el- elder fathers and mothers and brothers and sisters in the faith, their stories, their mm-hmm. witness, their continual pursuit of, of our Lord Jesus Christ, mm-hmm. and you know, a lot of a lot of our our journey, our faith journey, was born out of that those communities. Yeah, you absolutely. know, and many of those yeah. people that yeah, some of those names uh, people in the audience would find familiar. You know, mm-hmm. living down the block from yeah, Scott, Doctor Scott Hahn, and meeting lots of Richard's the, Godfather, Curtis Martin, Curtis Martin, right Focus, there, founder you know. of Focus, and yeah, lots yeah. of different people. So yeah, I thought I thought we'd talk about that today. So I mean, generally speaking, today I wanted to think about. Um, again, this thread that, that connects us all, we're all Christians, we're all followers of Jesus, and wherever we find ourselves in life, I think we all have the sense that that journey does not end, doesn't even really slow down until we we go home to meet our Lord, mm-hmm. hopefully. Um, but it shouldn't. It, it shouldn't. <laughs> it shouldn't. It and shouldn't, so yeah. it's because of that. That is something that connects us, you know, people in the Coming Home Network. You know, we're, we're all people that, that that's the reason why you have people considering upending their lives, their social lives, their their pastoral ministry, their friendships, their perhaps their perhaps the 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 comfort and comfort zone of their present place in their mm-hmm. marriage. It's because 
they're, they want to follow Jesus. And if you're trying to follow Jesus, I mean, look, look we look in the gospels, he's always, he's always uh, leading the, the disciples into some new direction. And they're like, oh, okay. You know, yeah. <laughs> even if it, it causes uh, some turbulence, but he's got a plan. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I was just thinking about that in context of our faith journeys and our family and the coming of network and the church. And I thought we would, because we're you know, looking forward in this show, we're going to be talking. You know, we're kind of, we're going to continue this conversation together as brothers. Maybe we'd start by by giving a bit more of the backstory of how we got here. You know, our family, uh, how the, the, the journeys of our parents and the coming home network itself, you know, influence our lives. And then just a, a little bit about our vocations now and how we see this obligation, this invitation, this opportunity in life in, in Jesus Christ to continue to follow and continue to grow, continue to surrender. So... Let's go way back. <laughs> For those who don't know, who aren't aware, I mean, so the Coming Home Network was started by our father, uh, Marcus Grodi. Um, and the reason why he started this network uh, of converts to the church and people who are thinking about becoming Catholic is because um, he was a Presbyterian minister. Mm-hmm. And so I was about five ish. I always forget that. I don't, I don't even remember necessarily asking you what you remember from that, you know, that I was, time of life. Right. Because. And it's hard because I've heard dad's dad's yeah. testimony so many times throughout my life that it's hard to always pick apart which are my memories and which are like manufactured yeah, ones. Yeah, there's that too. You know, right. like placing yeah. myself in the story that he's telling. <laughs> yeah. But I do have some memories of being a pastor's kid, mm. you know, at the Presbyterian Church here in Ohio. Um, you know, like the, sun, the Sunday school, the song. They still have a lot of the songs, you know, some of those songs are just sort of like baked into my DNA. Which ones? Because it'll be interesting. Because well, yeah, well, we know that one because Jesus in the boat. You could yeah. smile through the storm. That, Dad sang that one to us forever. Uh, that's though. true. I mean, that's afterwards, true. That's but true. I, yeah. I'm just I, I don't obviously I don't have any memories of that because I was yeah. one and right. I was the first baptized the Catholic first baptized yeah, yeah, in yeah, our family. That's right. um, <laughs> and I remember every moment. Um, no, but I, I don't remember anything from that time. Um, when he was actually a pastor. Yeah. So I have some memories of the church, some memories of the community. You know, a memory that he tells about, but that I don't actually have an image of, was of me crying when he explained to me that he was no longer going to be a pastor. Really? No longer going to be preaching up up there. He he tells that story. I don't remember it. Hmm. You know, but that apparently that impacted me that there, there was going to be this big change because at that time I didn't understand why, but he, mm-hmm. because of his convictions, right, couldn't preach as a Presbyterian anymore. And I'm sure you know? many people who are watching, maybe hopefully, I don't know, are aware of that story. But if not, that's a pretty fascinating part of his story was the fact that, yeah, he stepped down as a pastor because of his particular journey and, and where God was or where he where he was beginning to struggle with kind of questions of authority, authority. and the ability to preach ability to actually teach this is what the Bible says and means and everything mm-hmm. because of his questions and his struggles with those he stepped down as a pastor not super super long before he became Catholic but certainly long before he had made any sort of yeah. really a real inroad into thinking about yeah. that but no that's a really great point yeah so that, I mean this, this is something that we we admire in our father you know something we've re- I think received in some ways from him is that, mm-hmm. I mean, he, in some sense, he was pretty comfortable where he was. Yeah. It was a good place, you know, as a parish, you know, family, you know. Um, now, I mean, the, the Presbyterian church had its own problems that he was, I think my parents, our parents were um, increasingly a minority in their pro-life views, yeah. you know, which, which yeah. our, our mom had had a pretty, a, a significant conversion in her understanding of mm-hmm. that issue. And, and they were increasingly, uh, sort of marginalized. Because I think I asked her, actually. Hmm. I asked her, I think within the last year. Yeah. Because I, I never actually had been clear. I could be wrong, Mom, if you're watching this. But yeah. I believe I remember asking her that. saying, what was the main thing for you? Uh, you know, what was the main reason you became Catholic? And and she said it was the pro-life stuff. Right. You know, and, and I do, that kind of reminded me of thinking back to what she had she, she, you know, she doesn't really give her story in kind of this full way that dad ever, dad sure, does. Sure. And so I've never really heard it in that way. But, uh, yeah. but in piecemeal, I remember her talking about different things. And I know that that story for her is, um, I remember the conversion to that, yeah, uh, how that, how that looked for yeah. her. And I remember that being so really significant, but yeah. 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 For dad, it was a real crisis of authority. And obviously, mm-hmm. you know, his story is 
on the chnetwork.org. You can read the full testimony, watch the full testimony. But you know, the, the crucial thing was this crisis of authority mm-hmm. that in some sense, I mean, he loved doing what he's doing. I mean, he's always been a pastor at heart. So he wanted to preach, wanted to, to dig into scripture with people mm-hmm. and share that. But recognizing in the questions he was receiving, the, the crisis of authority in how do you determine what's true? When someone asks me about salvation, I know that my Presbyterian lens is different than the Lutheran lens down the road mm-hmm. or the Methodist or the Baptist. Sure. You know, or if I receive questions about baptism or the other sacraments. Well, he always tells that story mm-hmm. um, of how once a month all the pastors in town <laughs> would gather in the basement of one of their churches, mm-hmm. you know, and get together. Hey, Bob, Fred, what's going on? You know, like hanging out and all uh, chatting around and everything. Mm-hmm. And they'd all sit down and they have this big old, like, argument and debate, yeah. you know, about these parts of scripture about what they really meant and not of like insignificant things but of like really significant stuff like you're talking about and at the end of the night they'd all like hey we'll see you next month and everything and it was like it it didn't seem to make any real like concrete difference Mm -hmm. you know but he just he's like well there's you know this guy down the street and that guy down the street and that guy down the street Mm -hmm. and we all like really love jesus and we're all like leaders of our particular churches and we, we really love jesus and we believe we're led by the spirit and it you know, he believed that, you know, the teaching on salvation is this, and I believe the teaching on salvation is that, and we're all looking at scripture, and and he eventually just got to the point of how can I, yeah. how can I say that I'm right and they're wrong, and what right. by what authority do I have to say that? But and I, I yeah. and you know can't speak perfectly for Dad here, no. um, but I know that his wasn't necessarily this firm conviction that other guys were wrong. No, no, but it was a very personal process of discernment with God of saying, I don't think I can do this anymore. I don't think I'm called to do this anymore mm-hmm. until I, and unless I can answer these questions. Mm-hmm. And so as you noted earlier, when he left his ministry, it wasn't to become Catholic. Right. It was just that he didn't feel that that was what he could do anymore. He yep. still loved our Lord, but he had to go figure out what that mean. And so again, the rest of his testimony is there. I was about to say, yeah, you he became it. Catholic. <laughs> that happened. You know, when I was five, you were one ish. <laughs> Pause. Whatever. All right, and then come back. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that that I mean, so the next sort of section there is that that's what we that's the context we grew up in, is the parents of of or sorry the children of parents, who <laughs> became convicted yes. that yeah. the church uh, was the church that Christ established that He guides that has authority uh, that has its problems that always you know as a, as a community of fallen sinners like ourselves as a hospital for sinners not a hotel for saints as people like to say. Um, <laughs> It has its problems, but that the, the Holy Spirit continues to guide it and protect it. Um, so they became Catholic, and then we spent the early parts of our lives um, uh, interacting with other other people similarly. Like, so Dad started the Coming Home Network mm-hmm. pretty early on in our lives, and he, and he started the Coming Home Network because he was recognizing, oh, there's other pastors who've done the same thing. There's actually a lot of them. There's a lot of other people who have gone through a similar process and have entered the church. Um, uh, and some of them have entered and some of them are, are thinking about it, but it was an idea to be a network of support for them, particularly the pastors, mm-hmm. you know, because it, it is a huge shift for a person who's kind of rested their whole livelihood and professional life and their, you know, their higher education on the premise of being a pastor to then lay that all down and become Catholic. Mm-hmm. And that's a pretty big move, bigger than someone who doesn't have the same things riding on that decision. For sure. But then, as you said, you know, we grew up um, hearing his story, hearing him give this testimony to other people, uh, and and meeting other people who, through a similar um, movement of conviction, through a similar desire to follow Jesus and to to remain open to him, to remain kind of availed to how the Holy Spirit would lead them to a a deeper walk, became Catholic. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that, I I just got to say as a a point with all this, is that that's... um, it's funny, when I, when I was younger, maybe you had the same thing here, I was never super interested in the apologetics, the Catholic apologetics that uh, dad and others were often discussing through. Because mm-hmm. for me, you know, like, um, you know, I, we grew up as young Catholics. Um, I was more impacted by their their desire for truth, mm-hmm. like their, con- their, their continuous wanting to understand more, be more faithful, continue praying, continue being open for how... God was moving their lives. What do you mean you weren't like you weren't that interested in the apologetics? Well, so like I wasn't. About that. Uh, yeah, so I, uh, in the sense of like 
I mean, I did have a, a crisis of faith sort of in my teen years, but it was oh, it sure. wasn't about being Catholic or being Presbyterian. You know, for me, it was yeah. it was more the underlying. If this is true at all, <laughs> yep. then I I really think that Catholicism is is the place. Yeah, um, I mean, I never went through a struggle with it, but for some mm-hmm. reason, I was actually kind of fascinated by. Mm-hmm. I was fascinated by the questions mm-hmm. of of why be Catholic. Um, as opposed to these other things. Sure. Yeah. And I'd often have these moments where I'd kind of like, I'd sort of try to take a step back and and I'd sort of ask myself, like, is it possible that, mm. is it possible that the Catholicism isn't right? And I'd try to do a little mind experiment with that and everything. Yeah. And sometimes I'd get kind of spook myself out, you know. <laughs> but, yeah. but, uh, but no, I was actually always sort of a little bit fascinated by those questions. And I was but, fascinated yeah, in, a, in a similar way, I think, like that, okay. the yeah. thought experiments. But I, I, guess what I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that what what most impressed itself upon me is like the openness to truth, like the desire to understand mm. and to know, and this confidence that like you have nothing to lose by being open to the answers, mm-hmm. being open to the truth. You know, wherever you are in your life, I mean, at, at any point in your life, right? Whatever conception you have of reality in your mind is wrong. Mm-hmm. Now, it's not all wrong, but it, but large parts of it are low resolution, shoddy pale imitations of reality. Mm-hmm. And so like to be a person uh, of humility and a person who desires wisdom, you know, a philosopher to, to love wisdom, is to be a person who always takes their present knowledge with a grain of salt and is always open to God leading them into greater truth. Mm-hmm. We want the Holy Spirit to lead us into all truth. But that takes being a certain openness and a certain desire to be led further and mm-hmm. a certain openness to perhaps challenging questions, mm-hmm. you know, even challenging some of your preconceptions to see, could I be wrong about this? Mm-hmm. Could there be some part of this that I'm not understanding or that I can go deeper in, you know? Psychologically, um, there are two ways where we assimilate, like, or we kind of gain new knowledge or we learn, like, new things. Mm-hmm. Uh, two fundamental, fundamental ways. Uh, one is that some we learn, like, something new that, is basically we just kind of simply assimilate with our current kind of understanding mm-hmm. of the world, our current like framework sure. of reality. And there are other times where we learn something new and it clashes and it like mm-hmm. basically breaks like our, it, it breaks down like our fundamental understanding of reality and we have yeah. to kind of r- like come back around to it. Right. Sort of reformulate it with this particular thing now, sort of the adjustment made by this new kind of shattering element. Right. And that is like, that is utter. First of all, it's utterly frightening yeah. when that happens, and we probably we can all probably think of experiences that we've had. I can think of a lot of experiences that, especially getting right into college. We were philosophy majors, so yeah. I felt like it was every other day. <laughs> <laughs> but, <you know. laughs> but 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 it was frightening in particular because I think for me it was most frightening um, and it was most humbling, mm-hmm. is because I even in like the next moment after mm-hmm. like having like assimilated that stuff, new thing, whatever it happened to be. I could think back to the conviction that I had mm. the moment before mm. of thinking like I had life figured out, mm-hmm. you know, and like just like my hubris in that. And uh, and I feel like it's every day that every, every day, especially surrounding moments like that, or I just thank God that <laughs> he yeah. helped me to actually, you know, discover the new truth in some way and, you know, the, the truth in some way or other. Yeah. Um, and that he didn't allow me to just continue to be blinded by it. But, um, but yeah, it's more important to learn from those experiences and then st- to take stepping forward Yeah, to keep that little grain of salt with so many of the things that right. we know, you know, you know. Yeah, it's, a, it's a, the form of death and resurrection that we don't think about as much, mm-hmm. you know. And in, in the New Testament, it talks about dying to self, dying to the flesh, dying to the, the bodily desires, that kind of a thing. Well, sometimes again, we can we can take that and not see it in its full context. So it doesn't just it doesn't just limit it to the body. It mm-hmm. means sort of our, our lower our lower self, you know, our our, our disordered or sinful self. Uh, it's as much of an intellectual process as it is anything else. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a constant death and resurrection if we allow it, a death of our prior conception that gives way to something newer and better. Now, I love Lewis calls. I think in um, maybe a grief observed, maybe elsewhere too, but he calls God the great iconoclast because mm-hmm. he's always coming in and destroying our idols, mm-hmm. our idols of him, our idols of truth, our idols of our understanding of theology or philosophy. 
he takes what we have and says, I want to give you something better. You know, I want to, I want to show you more of myself, but to do that, you have to allow some of your previous imperfect faulty knowledge to mm -hmm. die, you know, mm -hmm. and, th and that always involves a little bit of death to self too, because it hurts a little bit to have to like, like, to accept correction, to accept, oh man, I, you know, I was wrong about this thing, you know, or in the moral life too, you know, as we, as we come to grips with our own sinfulness. Mm -hmm. I mean, you get one sin out of your life, right? Maybe you have a little success. You pray, oh, Lord, and you you work on it, and you get some bad habit out of your life. And, but... <laughs> do you? <laughs> if you do. No, I don't. If you do. Lord, yeah. help us if we do. Lord, help me. What we see, and this isn't a, this isn't a bad thing, but what we just see is with with almost like with greater uh, precision. Like, it's almost like the, the magnification lens is made a little brighter, and we're mm -hmm. able, to see, able to see actually more of how wretched we are. Yeah. And, you know, we shouldn't be discouraged or despairing at that. It should be a, a, the prompting to ever greater surrender and ever greater, oh, you know, Lord have mercy. I need your grace more than anything. That's what I need. So, but it involves this sort of death and resurrection, mm -hmm. you know, with Christ, this this constant um, allowing oneself to die in a certain respect so that God can make us into something new. Mm -hmm. So, But I, I mean, going back to, where the tangent began. I mean, that's something that really impacted me in my life. Right. I feel like <laughs> I, that that phrase, I feel like the to go back to where the tangent began is for you and me is to go back to like age 12. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I've been my whole life has our, been. Our whole life has long been. Long tangent. Anyway, sorry, continue though. Back yes. to where the tangent began. But that's, I mean, so again, in our father and in our mother and in many of the, the elder uh, Catholic Christian brothers and sisters, that we had in the faith, um, it wasn't. I like, and I will say for myself, it wasn't specifically the Catholic, non-Catholic apologetics so much. Was this this attitude towards truth? Because um, another aspect of it, it. So there's this desire to understand, to always go deeper, go deeper into Christ. Mm -hmm. That was something we we saw in them, and I was impacted by certainly. Um, but also that. I would say that by and by and large in the Coming Home Network, the people that we talk to, the people that Dad interviews on the Journey Home program, yeah. the people share their stories, who share in the online community, they're not people who become Catholic and look back in judgment or in disgust no, or in right. criticism. You know, they too look back and say, you know what? Those people in that Baptist church or that Presbyterian church, they showed me Christ. They taught me about Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. They taught me about the Bible. And so I, I think there's a fullness in Catholicism that I'd love to share with them, but they don't look back with anything, any any pride, mm -hmm. any any arrogance. They look back in humility and gratitude. I've been talking about this a lot lately in different conversations. Mm -hmm. The thing that I think struck me the most when I think back on the you know those times when we get to, we were very lucky in that we were homeschooled. And not just because we were homeschooled, but because we were homeschooled by a family like we had, right. because that gave us the opportunity uh, to go on these trips with dad mm -hmm. when he would go and speak different places and go to these conferences. And so we would not only get to hear him speak, we get to hear a lot of people speak right. that were really awesome. Um, when I remember listening to like his story, and in particular his story, sometimes other people's, sometimes other people's stories, but in particular his, because he's dad, you know, I mean, yeah. your, your father's going to make bigger impact on you. Mm -hmm. The thing that the things that struck me were most of the time they were they were they were the attitude that they had mm -hmm. towards God as a person. Yeah. In in a, in a personal way. Mm -hmm. So it's the stories like, you know, dad sitting on the lawn chair and looking up to God and asking <laughs> why and the bird poops in his face, you know, and things like that, you know. Classic but it, class, dad. Hey, classic dad. <laughs> classic dad, classic God. Classic bird. Classic bird. <laughs> classic, classic lawn chair. Classic, man. Classic. <laughs> exactly. We've all been there. <laughs> we, we, right. We, uh, like, right? Lawn chair, just, bird in the face. It's the oldest. Yeah. <laughs> just here today. Um, but what, what struck me was the, the personal way that they related to God. And all that yeah. stuff for them, for these people, you know, who were talking about their conversion stories, all that started, you know, in the faith that they developed mm -hmm. in the context of their kind of original uh, original Christian sex. Yeah. 
you know, and not specifically having started there at Catholicism. Catholicism is not the end point per se, but it was, mm-hmm. was farther down the line, right. but it, it started before that. And yeah. I, I owe, I think, a lot of my own an early, early explicit Christian experiences and experiences with God and relationship with God to, to that witness yeah. of yeah. dad. And not not specifically kind of a specifically Catholic witness, but right. more specifically just the witness of a person who had come to know our Lord Jesus Christ as a person and could relate to him as a person who was proactive in his life mm-hmm. and in a relationship with him slash right. them, you know, these people. But, that's totally right, yeah. And that's, that's true about a lot of the people that Dad then yeah, also talked with and shared with the yeah. many members of this network. You know, many times... I mean, the church is in an interesting situation in the last 500 years because of sin, all kinds of sins, you know, just because of the, the nature of, of, of humanity and the members of the people in the church, you know, like there was there was division. I mean, there was sin in the church and then there was reaction and overreaction. And, you know, we, we all know at least parts of that story of the Reformation. But the situation we find ourselves in now is that, you know, we, we have come to believe and are convinced that the Catholic Church is Christ's church. But we also, from our particular vantage point as as converts and children of converts, recognize that in the divisions in Christianity, our Lord has raised up many charisms and fruits even amidst our divisions. And so you know, one thing that, that oftentimes uh, Protestant Christians who become Catholic bring into the church is they're really good at articulating that personal relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ mm-hmm. in a way that sometimes Catholics have gotten really kind of rusty. They, they've ended up keeping it a little too private, a little too kind of too under wraps. It's, it's there for so many people, but they're not used to talking about it. Mm-hmm. And the problem is when you don't talk about it, other people don't pick it up. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I'll i say, so in regards to this topic, um, I did have some years in my teens where I went through a sort of crisis of faith. And it was just like, I think it was just connected to the spiritual battle in my life and certain sins in my life, you know, but... I liked being Catholic. I liked being, you know, Christian. I I, I wanted it all to be true, um, but I struggled with my own sin, and I struggled with the the conflict between the witness of uh, many Catholics around me, mm-hmm. which they seemed, and this probably wasn't always true, but it seemed to me that the faith was simply surface level, that it was just the thing they did, the club they attended, but that it didn't really impact uh, their heart, their life, that they. That uh, I remember somebody expressed to me once, you know, like, well, we faith means, you know, like we just have to trust, but we don't really know if any of it's true, and we'll know when we die. And I was like, <laughs> well, uh, I don't want like what? Wait, whoa, 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 because I contrast that within yeah. like the lives of the saints, yeah, you know, the the witness of the apostles and the witnesses of our Father and many of the people like him who mm-hmm. they they knew Jesus, right. That seemed to be a possibility. That seemed to be a proposal. That seemed to be what the church was proposing to us. Mm -hmm. But the question was like, but is that real? Because that's what Mm -hmm. I want. And I need to know if that's that's how it is. Yeah. Yeah. And yours yours was a bit more of an an intellectual, probably, crisis of faith. Mm -hmm. I think mine was probably a bit later on. I think mine was a bit of more of an, an emotional crisis of faith yeah. in some ways, but because mine had a lot to do with fear and a lot to do with my vocation, right? In the sense that my my taking my next real steps in my relationship with God had like everything to do with the fact that all like not all of a sudden, but little by little, God was kind of steered me towards the priesthood, and every time He kind of took another step that way of saying, or try to kind of push me to take another step that way, it was sort of like another crisis of like emotional faith of like, am I really going to, like this is so frightening to me and it yeah. requires such a big change in my life and change in my way of thinking about the future and everything and am, am I really going to, uh, am I actually going to make that choice to trust that God actually has it figured out? Right. You know, and it was just terrifying for me mm-hmm. and I fought tooth and nail against it often. Right. You know, and I could talk more about that if we wanted, but, but yeah. So we 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 everyone's going to have their crisis of faith one way or another because yeah. that's, that's sort of part of what it takes, you know, mm-hmm. to to move forward in your relationship with with God mm-hmm. is that you got to come to kind of that crossroad, um, that that fork in the road of just saying like, okay, like you're gonna you're gonna take a step forward, you're gonna take a step back, and yeah. I mean, he never God never gives up on you even if you do right. take a step right. back, but but he gives you that opportunity so that you can grow. You know, um, it makes me think about when we talk about the church being, you know, like a hospital and 
it's funny to me. I not always, but every time I look and I see like the quote unquote kind of ugliness of the church as it stands and everything, it, it's funny for me and sort of a weird way. It, it doesn't do anything to like remove or hurt the credibility of the church in my eyes. It actually, in a sense, like reinforces it mm. because it just, it, 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 it's, it's weird. It seems to me that it, rem, uh, it rem, and this is going to sound strange because it's not exactly the way that we all f- often feel about the church too, but yeah. I go Lord of the Rings, the line for Lord of the Rings where Frodo and Sam are following Aragorn mm. and uh, they just met him, and Sam asks Sam, uh, most of his are Frodo's like, you know, how how can we how how can we know if we can <laughs> trust this this Strider fellow? Yeah, Maybe he's an agent going. of the enemy. Yeah. And Frodo says, um, we don't really have a choice, Sam. But it seems to me that if he was an agent of the enemy, he would look fairer and feel fouler. Yeah. yeah. And there's something about the church that. Yeah, it often looks so foul on the outside, and yet I think when you really experience what the church is on the inside, kind of you know your normal sort of level, mm-hmm. when you really experience what the church is, it's like no, this is this is right. And and I look back to like the Old Testament and like the people of God, mm-hmm. right? I mean, you look at the story of the people of God; they are the worst. <laughs> I mean, like I mean, just in the sense of like in terms of faithfulness to God, you know, you look at just the Exodus story. It's like immediately after having been saved from Egypt and yeah. they go out and they're supposed to trust in God that he's going to provide for them and it's <laughs> like, like they're, they're the like guy walking around his garden and keeps up on a rake don't <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right you know and it, it's it's and it's not like oh look at those stupid people no it's like yeah. no that's just us now right. like that's that's you know why why are we so surprised that's at ourselves my past week that's yeah that's right, right that's me in so the, in and so in for, so, <laughs> so for me it's uh the people of God, whether, you know, originally the, the Israelites and moving forward into the coming forth of the church as the people of God, it's like our our identity is first and foremost summarized in the statement, Lord Jesus Christ, the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I mean, that's what it is, yeah. you know? And I feel like that's, you were talking about your crisis of faith, um, you know, kind of in, in high school and looking at looking at the people and seeing people and it seems just to be kind of like a, a thing that we sort of show that we kind of put up on the outside. And it, it uh, for me, the, the, the thing that always removes, breaks down those scales in my eyes for someone in my life when I'm like wondering whether like this is real for them is it's always statements like that. Mm. You know, it's always, it's always when someone like heartfelt recognizes like and says, in so many words, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, a sinner. I mean, there's something so pure and real and um, true, you know, mm-hmm. about that, about about asking God for mercy. I mean, that that like that gets so so much down to the essence of of our religion, you yeah. know. But, yeah, at, some, at certain points in our lives, we only turn to a statement like that when we're when we are in our own eyes on a surface level, like struggling with a certain sin or something like that, or a difficult situation, you know, but if we're, if we're attentive going along the Christian life, like that, that statement never becomes obsolete, the side of heaven, mm-hmm. you know, you only go deeper into it. Right. You only rec- you only discover a deeper and deeper need for God's mercy. And well, grace. and it's contrasted with two, the two false ways, false, way, false mm-hmm. things that we could do is in kind of a deliberate attempt to maintain some level of self sure, self surety or self righteousness mm-hmm we kind of forcibly ignore our need for mercy or our sinfulness. Mm, mm -hmm. Um, Or on the other hand, what we can do is when we come face to face with that, our, our kind of either our just our pride or our recognition or our our kind of maintaining of our own ego or our just inability to really humble ourselves before God Mm -hmm. basically pushes back against the idea that we can be redeemed. Yeah. You know, like, oh, I'm so bad, I can't, I can't be taught, you know, God, God can't even forgive me for this, or God can't do anything about this stuff. And they're both just elements of pride. And yeah. I mean, I love the, I love the contrast of Peter and Judas, because essentially mm-hmm. that's the contrast between them. I love mm-hmm. the story of Les Miserables, because yeah. the difference between Jean Valjean and Jean Javert Valjean. is yeah. the story of, of that, mm-hmm. you know, and, and Jean Javert jumps from the one to the other. He jumps right. straight from the, I am, I'm, 
I am, you know, I am the law, I am the righteous and everything. And when that's shattered, wow. he jumps straight to the other side. There's nothing I can do I to be redeemed. I hadn't that before. Yeah, the pride and, and the despair going exactly. right along with each other there. Yeah. Huh. Um, so, I don't and I'm sure you could talk more book. about that because you... Uh, you love talking about pride and despair, in particular being connected. But <laughs> I think we uh, did. We do any? We, I don't know, we talked, talked about that much during our virtue stuff. We'll we'll circle back around and dig those because I think that is a fascinating connection between pride and despair, and humility being the antidote to both. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've been reading a book about Acedia or Achadia or Acadia or whatever or, you want to, however you want to call it. Just like so but, many names. Yeah, that, yeah, <laughs> certainly. Or sloth or, sloth or, <laughs> or sloth or all this stuff. <laughs> Toads. I don't know what. <laughs> Certainly, the deepest kind of the deepest, darkest, and purest form of that vice is the despair of of the mercy of God. So, yeah. Yeah. But. so this yeah, again the 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 forward, uh, higher up, further in of the Christian life is is always one of recognizing a, a deeper a deeper mercy that we need. Um, it's neither, yeah, it's neither the pride of thinking, well, I've arrived and I'm fine and I'm good, nor is it the d- despair that I, I'm, oh, I did, it. <laughs> I messed it up again. You know, Lord, how would you, mm-hmm. how can you be patient with me? But but it, it, it proceeds. It's continual conversion. And it's part of accepting that. It's part of accepting the fact that it's going to be a journey and that I'm going to keep making mistakes to some degree mm-hmm. and recognizing deeper needs for mercy. It's part of accepting, re- recognizing that, being cool with that. Um so that you can, so that it's not, it's not such a surprise. It's not such a, something out of the ordinary to, to really turn fully to God and say, yeah, this, this really is all you, this mm-hmm. really all your grace, you know? Um, so we talked about kind of the family and this community of people we sort of met and encountered in the church as young men and, you know, the impact of our, our parents you know, this, this personal relationship with Christ we saw, this desire for truth, this continual conversion. And, of course, that's that's um, culminated in us being saints. Okay, have a good day. No, <laughs> no. no. But it's culminated in, uh, like, we're still here. We're still mm-hmm. talking about this. We're still trying to work it out. Um, we're still trying to live that continual conversion. It's led us into two very different vocations, two mm-hmm. very different ways of li- living that out. Yet, yet very similar. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And no. Yeah. Well, yes. and very similar in many ways. Yeah. 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 yeah but. I um. I mean, so I'll, I'll give the the brief. The you know, I'm I'm married, and I'll give the boxers. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we can cut that out. <laughs> <if you want. laughs> Leave it in. Uh, okay. Cheers. Uh, um, I am married with five kids. I live in here in Perrysburg, Ohio. Um, my kids go from nine down to one and a bit. Dominic. And they fluctuate. And they change. <laughs> it's an odd year right now. Yeah. So it's nine. Yeah, Dominic is nine. I love that. And Lucy <laughs> and Cecilia and Philomena and David. It's the only way I can remember them too. Yeah. Like it's, it's yeah, the odd do, year. I, okay. It's like yeah. doing the, the alphabet. You have to go, and go yeah. through to get, you know. Yep. But uh, my wife and I met uh, at Bowling Green State University. And that's kind of where I ended up toward the end of my intellectual reconversion, rediscovery of, of Christ. Um and and she had had a similar thing. She she was, was grew up Catholic and kind of fell away and came back to her faith. So we met there. Um, and I I had gone to seminary briefly. Mm-hmm. You know I'd considered that. Um, and I entered seminary. It was kind of at the same time I was wrestling with my faith a little bit. And I really had um, I had to kind of wrestle through this sense that well if I if I don't really want this then that must be what God's calling me to <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah. this expectation that God is his taskmaster who's like ready to yeah. kind of get you um, but getting there and recognizing I met other guys at seminary who really did have this calling to the priesthood you know they were they that, they were really experiencing that and to see that contrast a little bit gave me the the freedom to say you know what I'll come back if I really feel like God's calling mm-hmm. me to this but I I've always wanted to get married and have a family and so I'm going to go, you know, go pursue that and, and let God lead me. Well, and when you say wanted, I'm going to clarify this just for the sake of our brothers and sisters. Uh, when you say wanted, you're not just saying like, well, I've, I always had a desire to do it. Mm-hmm. You're saying you always felt like not just that there was a desire, but that that might actually be where God was leading you to. Because we would certainly not say that our brothers who joined seminary and joined the priesthood had no desire to have a family or 
You know? Sure, sure, sure. And that's just what I mean. From the outside, sometimes people can hear that and they can say, oh, well, if you had a desire to be married and that's yeah, what all it takes. Like, and all the like, way on well, and all the way off. No. Yeah. No, no, no yeah. by any means. In fact, yeah, so there's, yeah. No, yeah, no. Well, there's the two extremes there, right? There's, there's, right. there's this. I guess what I wrestled with was recognizing that part of the way that God, like, how mm-hmm. do we discern such things, right? Sure. It's partially, um, and God doesn't lead us to something that's that's so counter. Like, part of that desire is something He places within us, and He yeah. works. He builds on our nature. He well, there's He doesn't overwrite yeah. it or ignore it. You know, D- uh, uh, kind of developing understanding that I've been having mm-hmm. of when it comes to sort of discernment of priesthood and, and marital vocation is that like marital vocation is it's it's kind of like it, it should be basically like the starting point in the sense of like you should kind of assume mm. that that's that that's what you're going to be called to mm. because it, it is it is in a sense a much more normal vocation right. and not just normal in the sense of like it's plain or something but it's it's actually more normal for a human person yeah it's a natural a natural there's, order of things there's a natural order in the beginning you know god made man woman and made them to be together and everything that's a natural right. order and in a sense the call of like celibacy of priesthood is kind of a is, is a kind of a calling out of the natural order mm-hmm. and and it's like it's okay that's one of the reasons they call it a higher vocation mm-hmm. not better like bar none but right. but a kind of a higher because you're kind of being called out of the natural order right. and so because of that when it comes to sort of desire if you're trying to if you're using your desire as sort of a barometer on one hand like there it's perfectly natural for so, for a man to say um, you know, I don't really have any desire for the priesthood. I've never really felt God's calling me to that at all. And I just right. really don't have any desire for it. But I desire a family. And so mm-hmm. just to be, just kind of move forward with that in kind of a good faith. Yeah. However, it would be wrong uh. for a man to say, I've never really desired a family. Uh, that just seems distasteful oh, to me. That's a great point. <laughs> yeah, right. And so, and the church, because of that, the church is very cautious about. The church such is very men. cautious about men. <laughs> it, it is intentionally cautious about such men. In fact, right. if a man comes and they ask him, "Why do you want to become a priest?" and so if they give one of the reasons as, you know, I was just never attracted to family life. It never felt like it was going to be meaningful for me. Red I never flag. wanted it. It's a red flag. Yeah, yeah. Because because it's not about just like that. God's going to put a desire for one in you versus the other. Yes. That may happen when it comes to. Married life versus the priesthood, mm-hmm. because that's the that's normal. That's right, that's right. the normative kind of way. Mm-hmm. But when it comes to priesthood, you have to have a desire to be a good husband, mm-hmm. a good father, right. in order to be a good priest. Right. And so it, you, it can't they can't be contrasting in that way. I've been watching the um, the series, The Chosen. Mm. You haven't gotten around to watch it, have you? Das Chosen. It's so good, I man. Know, I know. I but that. again, that notion of being chosen, you know that yes. that. All those the people at that time, you know, all the all the, the Jews of that time, they were all called to be holy. They're all called to the follow of the Lord. They're all they were all called to this vocation of holiness that we're talking about here on the show, um, and they were all called in a certain sense to respond to Christ in His message and His revelation. But He chose the disciples. He called a few of them out to give them a special role, a special calling, a special mission, mm-hmm. um, and so. Yeah, there's a there's a, a, a chosen element of a, again the, this vocation, this calling, that and the, the, uh, it is a helpful distinction between the two. That on a natural level, we're all oriented towards marriage as a mm-hmm. natural goal and good that God orients us to, even on a biological level. Mm-hmm. But that um, we're talking about vocations in the Catholic context involving also a, a religious or a priesthood context. That there's an additional calling. Mm-hmm. There's a there's a higher calling there. And I didn't wasn't experiencing that when I went to seminary. Right. I was like, right. oh, okay, these guys really are being drawn to that, and I can see how I can see it's great. Actually, you know, so one one little anecdote here. I, I really liked at seminary. We you know, we we served the masses and read the readings and stuff, stuff together, whatever. I I didn't have a desire to be up there on the altar mm-hmm. and to perform the sacraments of the church, do that thing. I loved cleaning up after mass. Mm-hmm. I always loved like when everybody had left. And you know, as Catholics, the the vessels, the things involved in the sacrifice of the Mass, you know that 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 sacrament are very precious to us. I liked when after everybody left and just quietly tidying up. So I was like, maybe I'll be a janitor in the church someday or something like that. But I didn't I didn't have feel a calling to the priesthood at that time. Mm-hmm. So I I went off and went to finish college and met Teresa and we discerned for a while and you know we. We had we, in her. I mean, I think one of the main reasons I was attracted to her is because she too was a person who, once it had clicked for her, when she'd kind of 
reignited in her faith and come back to the faith, she is a person of insatiably wanting to go deeper and learn and understand. And, you know, that uh, that kind of relationship with the Lord and with truth, mm-hmm. you know, wanting to always go deeper. And so mm-hmm. here we are. You know, sure. Still yeah. still doing that, you know, still trying to yeah. go deeper all this time. Well, and the, the few kind of sparks along the way of my journey to seminary too mm-hmm. were, it was almost always people... I would say at least after I started my journey of discernment, of yeah. like really intentional discernment, the few kind of sparks along the way of of women who I was like, maybe I can be called to marriage, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, they were all people of that of that sort too. There's mm-hmm. there's women who first and foremost, like their their most attractive quality was their real love for God and that it was like a very intentional kind of part of of our friendship, mm-hmm. you know. And that was really beautiful. But now I'm here. Yeah, so. here we are. Yeah, and here we are. Brother and brother, father and brother. Brothers father. grody. The brothers grody. <laughs> yeah. That is not how I say it. <laughs> it's not how it's pronounced. Yeah. No. But that's, um, you know, I guess as as sort of uh, the first episode in this new season, mm-hmm. you know, we just want to give a little of that backstory. But talk about, again, this is hopefully what we share, you know, the, when we get together and talk here and, and otherwise is something we share with our audience, something we share with other members of the Coming Home Network. This is this is why we're all here is because we've come to believe and are convinced that Jesus is the Son of God, mm-hmm. and we want to follow him. We want to follow him. Um, I want to give a little backstory as to why we do this podcast. Do it, do it. For the last few years, every once in a while, you and me will sit on the couch, right, and we'll have a conversation about something. Yeah. And a number of different times, I a couple times, I think it was actually mostly you, mm-hmm would say something along the lines of, man, we just need to do this as a podcast. <laughs> like, I'd be like, you know, we just, we have these intentional conversations. Now, lately, but they, those are just kind of happen. Right. Now, lately, we've, on our own sides, but also together, sort of grown more convicted that having these sort of intentional conversations with yeah. each other is really important in our life. Yeah. And not just about this stuff, but... And not just kind of like talking on the surface about things that have happened or niceties that are happening or kind of yeah. things disconnected with us, but things that really get that that really encompass are encompassed by the statement that I mentioned earlier, like Lord Jesus right. Christ, Son of God, Living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Yeah, talking about our brokenness, talking about our need for prayers and for the, our our mutual support. Um, and there's an intentionality that we've been yeah. really trying to encompass there. Um. I mention I mention all that because one of the things that I've been very personally convicted by and we've been talking about is mm-hmm. and this goes all the way back to the beginning of this episode mm-hmm. that the probably the most important thing that we if I if I was to put my finger other than like the grace of God obviously but you know the grace of God is supporting all people it mm-hmm. is supporting a lot of different people you know if I was to put my finger on like what what do I attribute the fact that we had a kind of a foundation of faith and relationship with God that we could make it through those crises of faith, mm-hmm. or even really to have a crisis of faith. Yeah. I mean, that's you have to have faith point. to a certain extent to have a crisis of it. That's true. Um, why do why was that different for us than it was for so many young people these days? Mm-hmm. And I would say that it was the it was the receiving of the witness, mm-hmm. not only of Dad. Yeah. But also about these other people in our life who intentionally talked about their relationship with God, the, their need for mercy, and the and the powerful, uh, the powerful reality that God had been in their life. But also the books that Mom and Dad gave us on the mm-hmm. saints, mm-hmm. like the witness of the saints, was huge um, for me. Yeah, you know, I, I would read about the early virgin martyrs of the church, like Agatha and Lucy and stuff, and I just remember reading about their bravery, and it was just like. It was super inspiring. I mean, he's yeah. like, I was like a seven-year-old reading that stuff. Because of that, I'm just growing more and more convicted that one of the most important things that we need to be able to do with one another is to find the way to have the find the way to have the the courage to have these real conversations where we actually talk about the powerful. Di- First of all, we reflect in prayer to discover. And then to talk about the powerful differences that Christ has made in our lives, right. because that is how we are witnesses. Mm-hmm. You know, we who have not seen the resurrection, like the apostles, who are called witnesses of the resurrection, we are still yet called to be witnesses. And how are we to be witnesses except by basically being witnesses to the power of Christ in our lives? Yeah. So. I, oftentimes, I think 
this conversation is what we're trying this is to what we're doing right we're trying to do and this with, is yeah this is what people in the coming home network do right and yeah. a lot of it is because um i mean catholics these days catholics in this time in history often aren't great at that mm. for all sorts of reasons there's all sorts of kind of cultural just reasons about how at this present time in the history of the church catholics often aren't good at having that conversation oftentimes evangelical christians really are and so when they come home, they that's part of the patrimony they bring is this charism for witnessing to one another. Mm-hmm. And not just this this kind of an, a merely even evangelizational witnessing, like going out there and telling it, mm-hmm. but, but yeah, that sharing with one another. And again, there is like, I think we, we notice this about ourselves, that we'd love when those conversations would happen. But we'd sort of wait around for them to happen. But then at one point more recently, we said, no, no, we need to make this happen. Mm-hmm. In fact, maybe this is a part of the Christian life that for a couple introvert, introverted guys, it can be easy just to ignore, <laughs> like harder. just, just leave, yeah. leave well enough alone, but to yep. make it a point that this is what Christians do. They get together and they they talk as if this was real. Yeah, They right. talk like, well, what's the Lord been doing in your life? Because yeah. they see the spiritual reality of, mm-hmm. of God and his presence and his movement and the spiritual right. battle, which mm-hmm. we'll talk about next, next episode. Yep. But that's more real than the things we're often seeing as we walk around in life. It's all too much of a reality I see in many different, most different Catholic churches that I've been been to, and it's always a mix of people. I yeah. mean, it's never yeah. like I've, I've plenty of people that I've known that you know they bring them right over their house and we talk about faith stuff, and I try to try to support that. But I also recognize that for so many other people, it's it's almost like there's this taboo on if you're outside the church talking about faith stuff. Yeah, you know, it's like oh. You know, like, yeah, like we just that that stuff stays back there. Like we're 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 having dinner together, like, right. and they never say it as such. It's just like you just never stray into that reality, you yeah. know. Maybe it's because there's a bit of a fear of intimacy for people, but yeah. it also it 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 also sort of feels like no, that's that stays in the church. This is reality, you mm. know. There, there's a sense of that. Like yeah. this is the real world. Like you know, I go and pray to God, but when when the rubber hits the road, I need to just kind of buckle down and focus on it rather yeah. than bringing God into it, you know? Yeah. Um, and we really, well, we'll talk more about spiritual battling oh, in the next episode. So, Thank you, brother. Thank you for this conversation and for uh, that we can do this together. And thank you, um, fellow Christians, you know, and, and even if there's, if you're, maybe if you're not a Christian, if we have anybody watching this who's, who's maybe coming to know Christ for the first time, we're glad to have you here. Glad to share a little bit what Christ is doing in our lives. And we're glad to invite you to check out the Coming Home Network, you know, a network of people who are c- trying to continually uh, follow our Lord Jesus Christ. And many of them who have uh, come to believe and are convinced that the, the church, the Catholic church, is this fullness that he intended for us. Um, and that's what we're here to share. You know, but in the meantime, you know, wherever you are in your journey, we have to keep praying and keep walking with, with the Lord. So uh, thanks again, as always, for uh, listening. Uh, be sure to like and subscribe. And if you yourself are one of those people I was describing, if you're especially if you're someone who's thinking about becoming Catholic, visit chnetwork.org and be sure to join our online community at community.chnetwork.org uh, where you can interact with, with us and other members of the network and follow this show. So with that said, God bless you. We'll see you next time.